Hi y'all. In this video I'm going to be responding to a video done by Theron Meyer on uh, Trump's trans ban, which is titled My Thoughts on Trump's Trans Ban. So, uh, take it away Theron. Hey guys. So, as many of you probably know, on Wednesday President Donald Trump tweeted out, after consultation with my generals and military experts, please be advised that the United States government will not accept or allow transgender individuals to serve in any capacity in the U.S. military. Our military must be focused on decisive and overwhelming victory and cannot be burdened with the tremendous medical costs and disruption that transgender in the military would entail. The tweet. This is an eminently reasonable position, and uh, we'll talk about that uh, as the video goes on. Commit with praise from conservatives who believe that the military should run a tight ship that is no place for. Uh, I'm not a conservative, but I am a veteran, and I fully support the notion that the military should run a tight ship. The idea of a military, at least the American military, other militaries do things differently. Uh, the idea for us is that we should have the strongest possible military given the resources that we have at our disposal. So the reason we do recruitment and have a list of hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of reasons to exclude people is so that way we can get the strongest military we can get given our resources. Uh, and anything that does not contribute to that needs to be done away with. We are the least feminized military left uh, in the West, and we are the ones, apart from Israel, I think, who uh, take military preparedness the most seriously. Israel has no choice but to do it. Uh, unfortunately, they have a condition that we don't, namely in that they have very limited resources and we do not. Uh, you're going to do this later on, and it's very common uh, I know you're not on the left, but it's very common for people on the left to try to compare our military to militaries throughout uh, the world, and this really strikes me as bizarre. Uh, take the Canadian military's tweet after uh, Trump announced his ban, which said something like, diversity is our strength. I was like, really? Overwhelming, absolute, total dominance in war is ours. Um, but anyway, they like to compare our military to other people's military, as though they're in any sense whatever comparable. Uh, a good way to a good response to the Canadian military's proposition was when someone on Twitter wrote, uh, "By way of comparison, the Canadian military is ceremonial. It is nothing like the American military. It cannot contend with us on any front. Uh, one of the reasons that we are the strongest military is because we have a lot of resources and we put a lot of those resources into our military, but also uh, we uh, take Herculean efforts to eliminate the weak." social experiments. While liberals decried Trump for a blatantly discriminatory move that dishonors past, present, and future transgender servicemen. Um, there's no dishonor to not being allowed in the military. People with diabetes can't get in. We're not dishonoring diabetic citizens. People who have had concussions and have been knocked unconscious can be disqualified. We're not uh, dishonoring people who have been hit too hard in the head. Uh, we do this even if it's the case that that particular person, you know, some random individual from that group, a particular person who has uh, been knocked out for, say, 24 hours or longer, uh, will in fact not have had any brain damage and would in fact make a perfectly good soldier. The reason for it is that that is the diamond in the rough. And we are trying to get rid of as many of the bad or less desirable candidates as possible and we do this based on categories because people who fall in this category have a greater likelihood of being a liability uh, than the opposite. And so when you get that little point in, in the decision process, you go, uh, on the whole, it's better to just have a categorical exclusion of these people uh, because we can do without them. Uh, military service is not about the personal uh, aggrandizement of the individual. It's about sacrifice. And if you go look, uh, do an unbiased search, by which I mean open up you know, like incognito so it doesn't take an, it doesn't fact, doesn't wait the results that you're going to get based on your preferences, and you try to find the advantages of having transgendered folks serving in the military, what you will find is page after page after page after page after page after page of nothing but, here are the benefits that you as a transgendered person can get in this job, here are the benefits that you can get in that job, here are all the advantages that redound positively for you as a person. Your individual interest, not a single word about what it is they add to uh, such an organization. 
and the reason for it is quite clear. They don't bring anything particularly special to the table, such that the liability that, they ha that comes with them is going to be outweighed by whatever uh, imagined advantages there are to their service, and therefore we can do without them. Yes, it would be very lovely for those people, as on, you know, in their, for someone like you, for example, it would be very great for you to get a job in the military where your medical care is going to be covered for life, uh, even if you've transitioned before you get in, any injury that you get that might tend to serve to exacerbate any previous procedures you've had, you're entitled by law to lifetime care at government expense uh, in the VA. So, yeah, that's going to be great for the person. Not anything in the discussion is about what these people are going to bring to the units, what they are going to do to enhance our lethality or maintain our lethality, what they're going to do to cause units to perform better not a word on it because no one on the trans lobby side really cares about that. Whenever you hear something, some, oh, we need to take this into account, it's rhetoric without any real force behind it. It's lip service. In the eye of the public. But before I give you my thoughts on the whole situation, let's take a look at what was happening behind the scenes that led Trump to tweet out the controversial policy decision. Contrary to what Trump's tweets imply, transgender Americans serving in the military wasn't really being debated since Obama repealed the ban on transgender troops. Trump's snap tweet actually came after a prolonged House Republican battle over a spending bill that includes, amongst other things, funding for the Mexican border wall, as well as military health care coverage of sex reassignment surgery. The debate over taxpayer dollars going to sex change surgeries was threatening the passage of Trump's bill. And so GOP leaders turned to the White House to solve the problem. And in Trump's typical brash and clumsy wrecking ball style, what started as a dispute over health care for serving transgender troops soon became a ban on trans people in the military in any capacity whatsoever. Trump One of the things that doesn't work its way into these conversations, like the RAND study you're going to point out, is the actual cost to the taxpayer. They'll talk about the cost in the military. Uh, the costs of the military don't end with the military. Uh, we have this pesky habit of taking care of the people we blow up in war through the VA. We have this pesky habit of taking care of our veterans. So these studies and these discussions tend to forget the billions of dollars that we pour into the VA to take care of the problems we cause through all the injuries and other uh, conditions that we inflict upon people because of their military service. So whenever uh, so for my viewers and anyone else out there, whenever you hear people talking about the cost in the military, they are restricting the conversation from the true cost passed on to the taxpayer because it's more convenient to their position to ignore the billions upon billions of dollars that also go into taking care of these people after they leave the service. You, uh, you simply cannot divorce the one from the other. We blow someone's leg off or send them somewhere where their leg gets blown off. We foot the bill for that person's blown off leg and all of the related care for life. Similarly, if they have any pre-existing condition which doesn't automatically uh, uh, disqualify them, which is remotely exacerbated by military service, we pick up the tab for all of it. So even if people transition before they get in and you know, they get a new vagina put in or whatever, you know, I don't know, maybe a muffler, whatever you want to get done down there, you get done down there. If, any, if they can relate any possible injury or exacerbation of that condition to anything that happened to them in the service, the, tax, the American taxpayer has to pick up the bill. It is not right to, to let people into the service, injure them, exacerbate a problem, and then say, oh, pay for it for yourself. Uh, later on, you're going to talk about maybe you should just exclude these costs altogether. That line will never hold improperly so. Once they get in, if they can make it through the screening process, um, and they get in and they have any of these conditions, it is right that the American taxpayer pick up the dollar because... In fact, this person has been put in a worse state of affairs than they would have been otherwise because of their service. Statements weren't only met with opposition from liberals and Democrats, though. Fellow Republicans like Iowa GOP Senator Joni Ernst and Senator John McCain took serious issue. Regardless of the background on which the decision occurred, many people still see Trump's decision as common sense. A lot of medical conditions like diabetes and mood disorders are disqualifying conditions. The military is no place for people. Having taken a pill for ADHD or ADD or whatever you want to call it in your life disqualifies you. There are people who were very rambunctious and inattentive in their teens and they were wrongly prescribed this. They're still excluded. 
even though such there will be a subset in that category of people, uh, persons who will perform exquisitely well. We still don't let them in. Are we dishonoring children who were incorrectly given medication uh, to treat a condition they didn't actually have? No, we're not. It, it's uh, Whenever you do things on the basis of categories, you're going to have an, uh, an over-inclusion problem and an under-inclusion problem. You're going to fail to capture some of the things you want to capture, and you're going to uh, capture things that actually aren't there. So you're going to get some people caught up in it who uh, probably shouldn't be. But, you know, welcome to the military. Gender dysphoria and who are confused about their gender. But the For those who might be wondering, this is technically called an ecological fallacy problem. Uh, whenever, because... Uh, Whenever you take a sample of a population, uh, even if the sample is representative of a population, the, populate, the general trends in the population are not representative of the individual persons in that population, however defined it is, unless the definition of the person in the population is the necessary condition that puts them into the category you're talking about. So if you're talking about dead people, uh, then on that front, because it's a necessary consequence of being dead, you can't do certain things, uh, it'll be appropriate to apply that to each of the individuals. Uh, but those are the odd cases. And there, and there are always problems when you deal with categories. But the military is not a logical proposition. And the cost of this inductive reasoning of trying to uh, you know, make sure that, I'm sorry, to try to go through to make sure that this one particular person is the diamond in the rough, the cost that is going to be spent to find that one diamond in the rough dramatically outweighs any benefit that that diamond in the rough could possibly bring. These people do not come with extraordinary physical abilities. They don't come with extraordinary mental abilities. They aren't uh, like world geniuses without which the whole of, of society would collapse, that a war can't be won, and therefore we don't need to uh, undertake this expense. We don't need to uh, accept this liability for the possible benefit that no one can, can actually predict of the benefits they may or may not actually bring line of reasoning is very misguided because here's what you can tell about someone simply by knowing that they're trans, that their gender identity. That they will have a higher risk of suicidality. Uh, remember earlier I mentioned that when people want to talk about in the military and then they like to constrain it to just uh, the service without taking into account the lifetime effects that, re that uh, are going to be there for persons, who for veterans. Um, this is one of those examples. So uh, think carefully, and we'll let uh, Theron finish the point. He is different from their sex at birth. Here's what you can't tell about someone simply by... That's not true. What you can tell is they have a higher risk of suicidality. Uh, the, the VA actually does studies on this, because, uh, and the most comprehensive studies on it, because they don't have to do a sample, they can do a population, or something that is like, a, they can do a census, or something like a census, uh, namely in that every person who identifies as uh, having gender identity disorder, um, who, I, you know, who says, I have that, uh, in the VA, they have a record of it, and they checked all of them. They didn't take a sample. They looked at every single data point that exists, and they crunched the numbers. The suicide rate, or the, the suicide event rate, for transgendered persons, transgendered veterans, is 1,900 some odd percent higher than it is for veterans. Uh, against the general population, it's more than 2,300 percent as large. What you can tell from about uh, this population is that it comes with a much higher risk of self-harm, of suicidality, suicide ideation. Now, that does not mean every particular person in that category has that. This is the ecological uh, problem I uh, uh, dealt with earlier. But, well, and the expense to be put in to trying to find that one person, whether or not this one person is going to buck the trend or is going to be modeled by the trend, and whether or not, taking the dollars out of it, whether or not it's worth the lives that will be lost if you get it wrong. Now, one of the, the dueling narratives here is uh, uh, conservatives, like to, a lot of people on the right will say things like, oh, Chelsea Manning shows why you shouldn't let these people in. And then on the other side, you get people like, oh, look at Kristen Beck. Uh, Bradley and Chris, Christopher uh, are their birth names. Uh, Beck was a Navy SEAL and SEAL Team 6 who tweeted out after the ban, are you trying to say that I, as a, a person who has a Bronze Star medal and was in you know, SEAL Team 6, that I'm not good enough to serve? This is complete rhetoric. It's not about you as a person. It's about what are the liabilities and what are the advantages of dealing with this uh, on a group basis. Now, I agree 
that it's sometimes unpalatable to do this on the group basis. It would be nice if we had infinite resources and we could give every person in the world their own personal individualized plan where we have dozens of people who study them for as long as that's necessary to make all of the perfect predictions about how this person is going to perform in the future. We don't have that. We have a finite set of resources and we have to spend them wisely. It is better to the advantage of our military preparedness to put those where we can be more confident that we're going to get out a better result than uh, you know, putting in all this, all this extra effort for the diminishing returns it's going to bring. I'm going to do a more comprehensive video on the topic in general, but uh, just to give you an idea, the response to a Kristen Beck is, what about uh, children? During the Civil the youngest NCO in the United States military was a 12-year-old. He distinguished himself in combat. When a Confederate colonel tried to capture him, he killed the Confederate colonel, and then two days later was in the Battle of Chickamauga and was fighting hand-to-hand -hand against Confederate soldiers. Uh, he was made an NCO for his competence and for his performance under fire. So clearly there are some 12-year-olds who will do just fine serving in the military. So, I guess what we should have is not a categorical ban on all persons who are uh, beginning or uh, have just entered puberty. No, we need to have this very finely reticulated system whereby the government goes through and checks each one who wants to join to make sure that we're really absolutely doing the right thing by excluding this particular 12-year-old. And if, uh, you know, if the floodgates open and you have to do this time and time again, no matter what the cost is or how much of a marginal increase in the cost it might well be to do this, Every person needs to get their own individualized, customized, super finely reticulated analysis to make sure that when we say no, it's for perfectly the right reasons. No, of course not. The preponderance of evidence is that 12-year-olds are not reliable assets to military preparedness, and therefore we're not going to waste the money that would be required and waste the other resources that would be required to, to go through all of the 12-year-olds who possibly want to join to make sure that we always, always, always get it right. And by the way, one of uh, our coalition partners in Afghanistan was a 10-year-old who led, uh, you know, a, a company, or I guess a version of a company, of soldiers in combat against the Taliban. And uh, he was a very good commander. His unit won time and time and time and time again. And after he had finished taking over because his father was killed and then his uncle, who was the previous commander, had been disabled or whatever, and so uh, he took over from his uncle. And after he finished his time for uh, six weeks of leading these people and successful battle after successful battle after successful battle, he left the military to go to the fourth grade. And then he became an international star, which made it easy for the Taliban to track him down and murder him. But that 10-year-old boy apparently did extremely well in combat. So I guess we can't even draw the line at 12-year-olds. Now we have to take into account that they're in the United States. There could possibly be a 10-year-old somewhere who has that kind of skill set. Therefore, it would be dishonoring children to say that by dent of their developmental status, that it's more likely than not that they're going to be a liability as opposed to an asset. And then having a categorical rule that excludes them. No, no, no. We have to have this very reticulated system where it says we have a general pre uh, preference, but if you think you're special, then we have to stop everything to attend to just you because after all, service in the military isn't about um, well, all the things that war is about. It's really about making sure that you get everything that, you're, uh, that you believe you're entitled to. Knowing that they're trans. Their mental health status, whether they have clinically diagnosable gender dysphoria, the severity of the dysphoria, if they have it, how far they are in their transition, and the extent of their health care needs. And with normal people, we don't have to take into account any of that. There is no added strain to our resources in respect of folks uh, who don't have this. Whereas with each particular person in the category, you have to do an individualized analysis even on your metric. This is adding, uh, this is, this is adding cost to doing our military. One of the problems with the people who even when they're uh, conservatives, when it comes to their pet little hobby of things that they would like to see happen in the government. Uh, you will all, and you'll get the argument here, you'll always get that, oh, well, um, you know, the cost is, is small. It's just a, a little bit more. The uh, burden is just a little bit more. You hear this in, in courts when lawyers go in. We're not saying it's no burden. We're saying it's a small burden. Well, it, in isolation, that is a very good argument. The, the uh, resource problem that confronts people 
confronts the government is that every person with a pet little issue has the same argument. And if you listen to all of them, all these minor little things add up to, well, let's see where we are now, $20 trillion in debt. The fact is, when people say, we had money to do this, we had money to do that, we had money, no, we didn't have the money to do that. That's why it's called a debt and not a surplus or a balanced neutral budget. It's because even now, our budget is uh, running over what it is that we bring in. If you cut a trillion dollars off of our budget, you will start to repay our debt. And if you do it at a, a moderate rate, where it's not too severe to the economy, <laughs> something got in the house and it's flying around. And if you do it at a, a reasonable rate of just $200 billion per year to $250 billion per year payback, the next four or five generations of Americans will not live to see that debt retired. They're, the coffers are running dry. So when you say it's only a few million here, only a few million there, that's precisely how we get into these things in the, in the first place is all these people, oh, it's just a little bit here. It's just, it's, that's what gives rise to the joke. A billion here, a billion there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money. In less than one generation, under two presidents, the bulk of this was done, Bush and Obama, that a debt so large has been saddled around our children, our grandchildren, our great-great, I'm sorry, our great-grandchildren, our great-great-grandchildren, and our great-great-great-grandchildren, that they will work their whole lives paying back a debt, most of which was needlessly taken on. And here we have one... Other thing, this is, why, this is why people go into bankruptcy, uh, or they have overdraft fees. It's like, well, you know, I've already got like only, I've only, you know, I'm down to like five bucks, or I'm already in debt this much. What's a little bit more? It turns out all those little fees uh, and the extra um, interest rate, it really does add up to your principal, in addition to the principal. So we will be digging out from this debt for generations. The, there's... Uh, the it's only a little bit extra means it's only a little bit extra to the trillion dollars we're already spending per year that we don't actually have. We'll need to conduct so for those people who are bad with math, people who have a pet little hobby issue, uh, their one-legged pony they want to see ridden around whatever's convenient for them at the moment. Uh, if you take a trillion dollars and you add a little bit more to it, we're still spending st still spending a trillion dollars more uh, than we actually have. We can save money by not taking on the debt that's going to come with your little pet issue. And what we should be doing is looking at a lot of other people with their little pet issues of the day and saying, no, 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 no. But uh, the fact that we are failing to do that in other areas is not an argument to explode things even worse than they already are. You don't say, oh, well, because I'm already in debt, uh, let me just borrow more money on psychological evaluations already put in place by the military to determine these things. In other words, trans people who aren't fit for service because they are trans are already screened out of... No, they are not, and that is precisely why uh, you have the high suicide rate um, uh, among transgendered veterans, because the screening service, the screening that we do is already not sufficiently stringent to weed out the weak. Uh, normal soldiers we still don't do a great enough job screening out the weak in advance. And so we get this higher suicide rate in our veteran population, even among people who don't have some pre-existing mental condition, where we want to debate about, well, what's the severity of it? Uh, you know, how much of it do you have? So we're even, even now, we're not doing a good enough job there. The fact that we are failing on that is not an argument to say, well, you know, may as well just take on a little bit more with or without the ban. And yes, certainly the current readiness standards for U.S. military service will disqualify a lot of transgender people. But that doesn't mean that there aren't trans people who have, who do, and who will flourish in a military setting. At the end of the day, this particular line of reasoning seems... You know, I am absolutely confident that there are some uh, people who have felony convictions who have reformed their conduct and could serve perfectly well in the military. They have realized the folly of their ways, they have turned over a new leaf in life, maybe they found Jesus or whatever, and uh, they are now just upright, moral, wonderful citizens uh, who, if only we'd let them in and, and give them that opportunity, they would flourish. And still we say, the risk is not worth uh, the liability. Thank you. No, go away. ...to be fueled by anti-trans bias 
more than anything else. But it trans people from the military on the basis of medical costs doesn't make much sense either. Let's put aside the fact that medical costs for trans people would literally be a drop in the ocean for the world's most expensive military. Or you know, the funny thing about, as I mentioned a little while ago, about that ocean, it's made up of drops. And uh, each individual drop alone doesn't amount to much. But lots and lots of people want to add their drops to the ocean. The fact that the military spends about 10 times more on boner pills. Interesting that you mention that. Stress is one good cause of erectile dysfunction. In the, in the military, we don't permit uh, cosmetic surgery, uh, cosmetic uh, procedures, uh, things that you know redound to the individual uh, to help them really feel beautiful inside. What we do do, on the other hand, is if you uh, suffer from some condition, uh, we try to restore you to the way that you were before that condition once we've taken on the burden of having you. So if you lose a breast in the military, there is cosmetic surgery available to restore you to normal condition or as close as we can approximate it with cosmetics. Here, the transgendered folks aren't trying to get restored to their former condition. Like people who can't get it up are trying to be restored to their normal biological condition. Here, it's, well, I want to run away from that and uh, I want you guys to pay for it. And about this drop in the ocean, General Jack Keane on Fox the other day, I don't know where he gets his numbers from, but I guess they're as good as anybody else's because a lot of this shit seems to be made up. And so the uh, effect after the, the lifting of the ban and saying that you can stay and whatnot is that several thousand soldiers decided that they wanted to start getting medical care in the military. So the RAND study you're going to uh, talk about later was done on the, the hypothesis that it would only be a couple hundred, you know, hundred some odd people per year and yet, in the first uh, several months, according to General Jack Keane, it's been thousands. So they're off by an order of magnitude and more. Weird how in the, in the military, when you have a large budget, the, uh, the people who do the costing of these things always manage to dramatically underestimate the cost. Let's just say the Trump administration rules against providing trans-Pacific healthcare altogether. What about fit and ready trans people who have fully transitioned before serving? What about fit and ready trans people who can afford and provide their own healthcare? As I mentioned, once you get into the service, if we do anything to you that exacerbates any pre-existing condition we failed to screen you out for, we become liable for all of it. And what kind of, uh, what kind of law do you think is going to get passed that says, if you get in the military and we injure you, or exacerbate a previous condition which didn't disqualify you, we're nevertheless going to refuse to pay for it. What kind of a law do you think is, uh, of that type is going to get put on the books? Precisely zero, because people from all sides of the political spectrum are going to uh, resist that for quite appropriate reasons. If Once we let you in and we do something that harms you, we have a moral obligation to put it right, to return you to whatever condition it was you were in, or as close as we can approximate it, when we found you. If we leave, if we say, oh, <laughs> where we found you is where we're going to leave you, thanks, but no thanks, we don't have to cover any of it. What about fit and ready trans people who are willing to put their transition on hold or postpone starting their transition so they can serve and protect their country? I agree, but we're going to have a slightly different emphasis. Yeah, what about these people? What do they bring? I, the, as I mentioned earlier, if you do an unbiased search for the advantages of having transgendered folks, all you see are the advantages that re, uh, all the advantages that redound to the benefit of the individual. So I know what they're going to get. Not a word about what it is they're going to bring. The liabilities, on the other hand, are trivially easy to spot, and they are uh, multifarious. In fact, uh, most of the arguments that the, the trans activists, the trans lobbyists, uh, most of their argument time is going to be spent on addressing these liabilities and why we shouldn't really care that much about them. We should care about them. Uh, we should care about them a tremendous amount. How many American soldiers' lives are going to be worth it to get these people uh, in there and, and to make them feel welcome and to really shore up our diversity bona fides because that's oh so important to destroying, absolutely annihilating anyone who is so foolish as to challenge us in martial combat. In, in the martial endeavor. Latching on to Trump's statements that trans people would disrupt military operations, many have referred to transgender troops as social experiments 
that would impede on the readiness and lethality of the U.S. force. I guess calling it an experiment implies that we... It, this is perfectly correct. We already have units that can't fix their vehicles because the, the funds don't exist to get replacement parts, and therefore they have to cannibalize uh, other vehicles. So if you have one vehicle missing this part and one vehicle missing another part, and uh, you know you gotta kill what you gotta cannibalize from one of them, assuming it has a working part that'll fit the other, to get one working vehicle. If you don't, if one doesn't have the part that uh, the, the other one needs, then you have to make a choice between cannibalizing yet a third vehicle. So you've got to compare uh, its state against the possible state of the two that are already dead. We already have that, and yet you're saying it doesn't matter that we already have equipment that can't be repaired. The whatever uh, equipment that we're not going to be uh, able to repair because we're taking money from something to pay for my socially preferable experiment of the military is just fine. And in fact, I'm going to think it's a little bit dubious to say it's a social experiment at all. Let's really unpack that language. It is an experiment. It is a needless experiment. We need our military to be ready, not to be playing around Catering to making sh uh, catering to all these things that other militaries you want to mention uh, do. We're going to talk about some of those in a little while. No way of knowing the outcome of allowing trans people to serve, except that we do have ways of predicting the outcome. Apart from all the transgender troops that have served and currently serve in the U.S. military, there are currently and their exceedingly astronomically high rate of self harm, suicide, uh, and all these other things. Yeah, apart from that, yes, do go on. 18 foreign militaries across the world that allow trans people. I hate it when our military is compared to other militaries. No combination of those 18 militaries is our equal. None of them can stand up against the United States military. Technologically, uh, you know, troop morale, on any level that's going to be relevant to war, none of those countries is our equal, and not all of them put together is our equal. You can build a coalition with all of those countries that you want, and they will not stack up against our military. And wars are still won, despite the technology, are still won by uh, the man on the battlefield with his rifle. No matter how much you saw, ultimately that is the cleanup. To, that, that is what brings about the cessation of the war. It is still that, uh, as it has always been been the individual men working together on the ground, living, breathing, dying, and bleeding together in order to uh, kill an enemy. So the, one of the reasons that our military is much stronger than all these is we have resisted the, uh, the temptation to feminize our military to the extent of these others. We have refused to take on all these little socially preferable to certain quarters type uh, experiments uh, for our military. We have taken on some of them. And uh, you know you get mixed results, but we—it's uh, one of the reasons our economy is the lar is, you know we're so much more productive is we are the least infected by socialism the same way that our military is the least infected by wanting to play all these games that have nothing whatever to do to winning a war. To serve, including Australia, Israel, Britain. We'll come back to Australia. I chose Australia because you chose to use it first. Sweden and Canada. So clearly there's a lot of case studies and precedent to go from. In most of these places, transgender troops must undergo hormone therapy or surgery before they can serve. In Britain, individuals must live as their target gender for two years before they are granted legal recognition. In Israel, where military service is mandatory, there are special programs to support... Oh, a special program, you say. Gee, couldn't have seen that coming, that there would be a special program for the special soldiers, unlike no special program for the non-special soldiers, you know, the not added cost for the ordinary folks who uh, don't present as great of a risk as the special people are going to present and who don't cost as much as the special people are going to cost. Why? Because we don't need to have a special program to deal with their special issues because they don't have those special issues. In other words, we can take these off the shelf, do a bit of training, and get them out there and they're good. The Special program people, you take them off the shelf, and then you have to polish them a little bit, do a little bit of tailoring, and then you can do the other stuff. And you still have the greater, uh, the increased risk. Gender recruits. And so far, none of these countries have reported experiencing ill effects from opening up their armed services to the transgender community. <laughs> well, the ill effects is that they're all inferior militaries to ours. <laughs> I mean, you know, 
It might not seem like a lot because they're our allies right now, but if they ever decide to get froggy and step up, even as a coalition, they're going to find out real quick uh, what the folly of their thinking has been. It's a curious thing about militaries. The problems that you invite only tend to become exceedingly obvious once you have thousands of dead people lying around you. You go, oh, well, you know, guess that decision didn't work out so great. Um, so, so sorry we didn't see this coming. Who would have thought that if you bring in people who have lots of other issues in an environment that break strong people, that you would have a weaker force? Well, you know, I guess we learned our lesson this time. I can't remember uh, what show I was watching, but it was a, mil a military analyst was talking about when the Americans went to World War II and joined uh, Montgomery in, in Africa. Uh, the, Amer the American military went in and repeated all of the same mistakes and got the same results. They did all the same things the British did, and they got all the same dead people too. And the reason for it is this, is that militaries of a country don't learn from the failures of other militaries. The United States military has learned its lesson. We now study the failures of other militaries and we weed that shit out, which is why when we went to Iraq and we captured some of their tankers uh, who, when they were taken prisoner, got in the back of the tank and they saw that one of our tankers had a picture of uh, Rommel up in the back of his tank. He says, why would you have the picture of a Nazi up in your tank? And, and the, uh, the specialist for the private there says, you know, if you'd done a little bit more looking at this man, you wouldn't be sitting in the back of my track right now as my prisoner. Report by the Rand Corporation, which the Pentagon cited in its decision to lift the ban, looked closely at these countries. Research has found that the available evidence on transgender personnel serving openly in foreign militaries indicated no significant effect on cohesion. So even they say there is an effect on cohesion, and I noticed that they didn't look at what's the, the cost that gets passed along after the people leave the service and what are the risks uh, and whatnot. And one of the reasons is because you go to a bunch of countries that are you know, socialist through and through, where it's all covered in the, the uh, you know, social, socialized medicine exists everywhere. Uh, so there's going to be costs we're going to have that they're not going to have because they're already folded into the tax base as it is. Now, are you going to argue, well, we could just make this cost disappear by, again, the principle of explosion, by socializing all the medicine, and then that, that cost just kind of disappears. It doesn't really disappear, it's just harder to find. You have to look a little bit more uh, carefully to find it, which the Rand Corporation oddly did not do, because uh, why? It's what Ash Carter asked them to do, is to look at the cost in the military, not the cost of having them in, uh, serve in the military overall. It's just what is the cost to the DOD? And uh, he is the defense secretary. He was the defense secretary. His obligation is to look at the budget of the Defense Department. Don't need to worry about that pesky budget of the, the Department of Veterans Affairs because they can fight for themselves. But all the cost goes back to the same people, the American taxpayer. Some of the cost uh, is actually borne by the soldiers who are going to die when, I don't know, one soldier who's, who has gender identity dysphoria is going to get all hurty inside and off himself, and so that's going to reduce unit effect. And putting that off the side, I'll discuss more of this in my more comprehensive video, which isn't a response to Theron. Operational effectiveness or readiness. Now, I'm not going to pretend like the current evidence is conclusive. A lot more investigation and deliberation would need to happen before we can reach that point. I'm so before we reach that point, wouldn't the ideal solution be to say, we'll just say no entirely, unless and until someone can come forth with some reason to think that there is an actual advantage to having transgendered folks in respect of our military preparedness and the lethality of our military. Which, again, uh, there's no evidence uh, that, that you can find, or at least not it's easy to find. Maybe it exists, but it's not my obligation to find it. As a trans activist and a trans lobbyist, maybe you should go out and find it and then present that with us and we can have an honest conversation about whether or not this uh, ostensible benefit is worth a liability. I'm not against the possibility that Barack Obama's policies surrounding transgender troops were way too liberal to be effective. Uh, yeah. See, this is way too liberal. But if it's only marginally liberal and I get what I want, then, eh, you know, just a little bit more, just another spit in the oceans, okay. But I do think many supporters of Trump's decision see the integration of trans people into the military as a lot more complicated and more disruptive than it actually is. Interestingly enough, uh, as a person who has served, uh, every incremental disruption and every incremental reduction 
in our capacity. Actually, uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, accumulate linearly. It's not like, oh, well, you know, you do a little bit of this, and then you have a slight reduction, and that's okay. Uh, and then you add a little bit more to it, and it's an equivalent. No, it, it, these things build, and they build, and they build, until you hit a breaking point, and that crushes unit morale. And constantly, the evil, straight white men who make up the bulk of our military being told, just deal with it. Just deal with it. Just deal with it. Just deal with it. Well, okay, you can do that for a little bit, but in the same way that you wind up with trillions, tens of trillions of dollars of debt by small incremental steps, so too do you deplete the morale and the effectiveness of a unit by incremental steps. The enemy, uh, when, you, when you fight an enemy in war, they don't go, well, we're going to do this one thing that's going to crush their morale. It's, we'll do a little bit of this that's going to affect their morale, a little bit of that that's going to affect their morale, a little bit of the other to affect their morale. And these things all, uh, all multiply. They all build up and build up and build up. And where the flip is going to come over, you can't, uh, you can't predict. But the one thing that we know that is absolutely clear is that no matter what, each particular person is going to have the argument that the new burden I want to impose on you is just slight. So too was the burden that the previous group wanted to impose on you, and so was the burden of the previous group. And no matter how much of these very slight new burdens we're going to impose on you, you just have to simply smile, suck it up, and continue dying for the privilege of being told that your life is not really all that valuable uh, when compared against my particular pet political issue. Thank you. No. If you want uh, trans folks in the military, you should go find a positive reason that they are essential. The reason that we can get away with having a certain suicide rate of white men that's, uh, I don't know, a little bit higher than a suicide rate of black men, for example, is because they are the majority of the population. And therefore, we are stuck with them if we're going to have a military. If there were a way to get around this, we would probably try to exploit that to have an even stronger military. But because there is a certain baseline rate that we just can't get away with if we're going to have this military, uh, is not an argument that it's okay to not get rid of the things that we can easily do without, which, sad to say for uh, you and uh, your fellow uh, lobbyists, is a group of people who have a very high incidence of suicidality, self-harm, medical costs, and mental uh, conditions that we simply can quite easily entirely do without. Now, uh, I, the reason I stopped the video is not to cut off her argument. It's simply because the video stopped and I didn't feel like having to scrub back through on my phone to find the precise point. But uh, she does make some arguments later on about how she can see maybe the total ban this, maybe that, maybe the other, trying to really give it a, a bit more balance, but I'm less interested in that anyway than I am in uh, responding to the arguments that simply do not work. It's complete nonsense. All right, have a great day. Little insert here because I forgot to do the Australia thing like I promised I would do because the uh, video stopped. So uh, here is how it works in Australia. So you get a diagnosis, there's a medical cert a certificate presented to the uh, commander or the manager and discussion, then a discussion has to begin. A discussion between the commander and the service member, including but not limited to leave arrangements. Would the member like to take leave prior to commencing the social realignment phase? Posting action. Does the member wish to relocate to another unit and or locality? If so, the commander is to assist and discuss with career management agency. And then, of course, getting new uniforms, uh, change of name stuff. Housing. The member may need uh, the assistance of their commander with regards to service residence, rental assistance, or appropriate living in accommodation. Uh, they get a mentor and a case manager, uh, ablutions. Discuss with the member which toilet and shower facilities they would prefer to use, not who might prefer not to use them with them, but who, where do they feel most comfortable? Not what everybody else would feel most comfortable with. Because it's all about what redounds to their, posit their positive experience, and everyone else be damned. We're all familiar with the tyranny of the majority. This is the tyranny of the minority. I'm going to shower with you, whether you like it or not. Uh, has the member arranged to speak with the defense community organization for assistance for themselves? Informing the workplace. When, how, and where this should occur needs to be agreed between the member 
and their commander, uh, commander or their manager. When I was in the Army during uh, basic training in AIT, I did uh, OSIT, one station unit training, so you do it all in one, one uh, block of time, so you don't go to a basic training facility and then you leave there and uh, go to a place particular uh, for your individual training for whatever your career field is. It's all done at the same place. I had to take leave, emergency leave, um, and to do, because someone in my immediate family died. And I get back and the drill uh, sergeants in the cadre, the commander, the first sergeant, uh, pulled me off to the side and gave me a briefing about uh, morale issues that attend when someone has gotten special treatment that other people haven't gotten, even when the person's getting special treatment for a good reason. Uh, so, like, if you get shot or something, uh, that's one kind of thing, but uh, when, something, when something bad happens to you and you get a break from the rigors that other people aren't getting, even if there's a pretty good reason for it, in this case, no one's going to begrudge someone, like if their kid or their parent dies, uh, taking you, you know, a two-day leave during training, or even a combat zone to go bury that loved one. They don't dislike you because that has happened to you, but nevertheless, you have gotten a break from the rigors that other people haven't gotten, even if it's unavoidable. And so when you get back, you have to take into account that you're going to have a freshness of mind and a renewal of spirit that other people have not had the opportunity to have, even though you're off dealing with something that is itself difficult. Uh, in those cases, it's one thing, but in this case, it's something different. These are all extravagance, uh, extravagances that aren't available to the ordinary soldier. And that is going to work some un, some intangible uh, detriment to the morale of the unit. When you get back, when I got back, there was a bit of an alienation that took a little bit of time for people to get over because I had gotten to sleep longer than they had gotten. I had gotten better food than they had gotten. I uh, got to wear civilian clothes. I could have gone out drinking for all they know. I could have partied. I got to see my family, though not under ideal circumstances. These are all things which it, uh, were denied to all of my fellow service members. Even though the reason that I got to go enjoy these things came at a cost, I got to enjoy them in a way that none of my contemporaries got to enjoy. And so there's an awkwardness when you return. And there is a small hit to the morale of the unit because they're like, oh, you know, you get ripped for it. Uh, you got this and we didn't. So you're going to get some of that. Now, one of the things that trans activists and trans lobbyists were on Twitter going on about, uh, Lady Gaga was among them, uh, was about how the burdens of life that attend people, transgendered folks, are already so severe. They get bullied and this leads to their high suicide rate. That is not going to be diminished. It's going to be magnified when you have these types of uh, situations. And that's one of the reasons why they had to develop a special policy in Australia to offer to that service member the opportunity to be relocated for no military purpose, just for the comfort of the individual. In the United States military, when we relocate a person from one unit to another unit, it's either on a regular schedule because of permanent change of station, just because duty assignments change, billets change, and whatnot, uh, or because the, uh, 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 an NCO, for example, has been demoted and seeing a former leader being reduced in that way does not engender confidence in their ability to lead. And so we send them away to another unit where they, they don't have that detriment. So that way it, uh, it's not for their comfort. In this case, it's a fallen leader, which does have a morale hit on the unit larger than the, the taking of a leave uh, for some other circumstance. So these things are important and they are not going to be captured in any RAND study. If someone had a magic wand where they could say you do this, you do that, you do the other, you get this type of morale thing, you'd have one state of affairs. But it, it, it is not linear like that. It's not tangible and you can't quantify uh, very particularly how these things work. But what you can notice is when the morale is changing and when person when a person returns to these types of things, they're going to get a certain amount of flack. And uh, that flack, particularly because transgendered folks are apparently less able to handle it than other folks, there's a high suicide rate being some testament to that, is one of the reasons that they get, they get these special dispensations that are just denied to other soldiers unless doing it for that, unless doing it to that soldier uh, so serves some military purpose, like not reducing the morale of the unit by 
a former leader, uh, you know, like a staff sergeant being reduced to a sergeant, uh, and then the new troops under this now lower ranking person who's been demoted having to question, well, you got demoted once, how competent are you to lead me? I mean, you couldn't handle your last job where people's lives are in your hand and now you're, I'm being stuck with you? So they bury that in that person's file and ship them off somewhere else where the new soldiers don't know that, the, that this leader is fallen, has been bad at his job, has been hazardous to his troops. That's shit that you've got to think about. Uh, if you're a service member, it's shit you don't have to think about. If you're some uh, rhetorician or some politically motivated lobbyist who says, oh, you know, these little burdens are just trivial. They're not trivial. They get people killed.